Welcome to the ACT's webinar on leases. How big an issue is this new accounting standard for corporates? What should corporates be thinking about pre-implementation? Today we hope to answer these questions and more. I'm Michelle Price, Associate Policy and Technical Director here at the ACT. Today I'm joined by two panelists, Henry Watson, who is the Structured Finance Manager at BP, and Matthew Stone, Head of Long Income at m and Real Estate. This webinar will be approximately 45 minutes long with a brief presentation by each of our panelists followed by a short panel discussion. So by way of background, in January 2016, the IFB published the long-awaited account standard IPRESS 16 on leases, replacing IES 17. IPRESS 16 will effectively bring an end to the off-balance sheet reporting of operating leases. Under the new standard, all leases will be on balance sheet as a right of use asset, so effectively lease asset and also a lease liability. Hence, IFRS 16 will have a significant impact on the balance sheets of those companies with a material amount of lease commitments. But that's the very big picture, and as usual, the devil is in the detail. Let me hand over to Henry, followed by Matthew, who is we're both going to explain more. Henry. Thanks, Michelle. As Michelle mentioned, under IFRS 16, leases will come, lease assets will come on, on balance sheet as uh, right of use assets and liabilities. Um, this will be effective from annual reporting periods um, beginning on or after the 1st of January 2019. And it covers new and existing leases, which um, are still in place in that period. Uh, Lessees may, well may elect to exclude leases which are immaterial, um, less than $5,000 as suggested by the international country center board on which term is 12 months or less. Um, most of this, most of my presentation will be about lessee accounting. Lessor accounting is substantially unchanged. So on the balance sheet, um, there will be a right of use asset, which will be evaluated as the present value of lease payments, which will be discounted either at the interest rate and interest in the lease, or if that is not available, then at the lessee's incremental borrowing rate. We'll have a look at these rates in a minute. But typically, the asset will be depreciated on a straight line basis. The liability um, will equal the same as the asset at the start, and it will reduce on a declining balance basis with higher interest charge at the beginning. So, as per the chart, the lease asset will um, depreciate more um, rapidly than lease liability at any point in time. Apart from right at the beginning or right at the end, the liability will be more than the asset. So the net impact will be a, a reduction in equity. P&L. So the lease expense, the rentals are split into um, two elements. So the interest expense, which as you said is higher at the start of the lease, and the depreciation of the fixed asset, which as I said is typically straight line. Uh, and you can see in the chart that the lease expense will be higher at, at the beginning because the interest expense is higher. Um, the lease rental, this is assuming constant lease rentals, which is normally the case. Um, for a portfolio of leases, this, this effect will sort of wash out um, um, and the lease expense will equal the lease rental if they're evenly distributed. Cash flow. Um, well, previously, lease rentals were operating activities, and now they'll be split into interest paid, which is an operating activity, and debt free payment, which is a financing activity. So, what will the impact be on key metrics? So, starting off with the replacement cost operating profit. Uh, so, in the first column, we see what's currently reported, so the lease rentals. Um, from 1119 to be just depreciation, so therefore our cost will increase. Operating cash flow, lease rentals will be replaced by interest paid, so again it will increase. EBITDA will have a sort of double family increase because lease rentals will be replaced by nothing at all. So uh, under the new standard, lease, leases will not be um, reported in earnings before interest and tax and depreciation. So it will be quite a significant increase for EBITDA. 
We have the rating agency metrics, uh, standard and poor's, for example, quantum operations, and further down adjusted debt. They will be largely unchanged because the rating agencies are already and have for many years been taking leases into account as assets and liability, treating them as, as a form of debt. They will have more visibility of the lease liability going forward, and so the, the, the numbers will change, but in principle the, 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 the methodology, the underlying methodology is the same. Um, fixed assets, fixed financial liabilities will increase, equity will decrease, as I mentioned before, um, and there's slight increase in financial liabilities. Um, and, and so the increase in financial liabilities and the increase in gearing because of the, the on-book on debt. So what are these transition rules? Um, as I mentioned, it will be applicable from the funding period from the 1st of January 2019. Um, companies have a choice. They can either act as if the standard, new standard had been in place um, from, from, from day one. Um, and state comparatives. So you work out well, what, what would you have reported at the end of, say, 2017 or 2018 if you were showing a couple of years of comparatives? What would you have reported had the standard been in place right from the beginning of the lease? Uh, there's an alternative is a modified retrospective approach, which um, uh, does not demand comparatives that are, are restated. Um, it also means that leases which terminate uh, within 12 months of your date of initial application, so less than 12 months or not more than 12 months left to run, can be excluded. And um, lease liabilities uh, are therefore future payments from the date of initial application, discounted at the lessee's incremental borrowing rate, so you don't have to work out the interest rate in this in the lease. Lease assets can either be the same as lease liabilities or on a lease by lease basis they can be calculated as if IRS had been in place from the beginning of the lease. So if you have a very material lease, you may want to do this extra step to, to reduce your assets on your balance sheet and also to reduce your depreciation going forward. So I'll put it on implementation. Um, and governance. So this is this is an example of how it might work. Um, it, it tends to touch many many aspects of, of a company uh, at all levels, um, and I think it would be monitored, overseen by the by by the main board audit committee, for example, or the group risk committee, whatever is appropriate in the in the organisation. There'll be a steering committee, a senior level steering committee, project governance. And underneath that, there will be, I think, three, three elements, potentially. Accounting policy, rewriting the new policy for the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the entity. Data, of course, is a very big IT requirement for this. And the, the financial framework. So in other words, you know, what are your limits of gearing? Do they have to be adjusted? Um, and, and how do you, do you control um, or, or manage the entry into new leases? Henry, just on that point on policy, um, are there any um, specific accounting policies which you think would be, that you see would be impacted? Well, there are, I mean, there are some, some issues with which, which are coming through as, as, as we work through this. Um, the, um, for example, intercompany leases. So you, you have a, a company can lease in to one entity, and then that entity can then sublease to another company within the group, so the intercompany lease. Um, and because it would be well, like a finance lease, we then have an asset in, in, the, in, the, in the sub, the sub lessee will have an asset, the, um, the, the lessor um, will have a receiver. And there will be mechanical difficulties or challenges with that consolidating out um, on consolidation. So that's something that has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, joint operations, something we see in the oil industry quite a bit where you have... Uh, an unincorporated JV uh, and the operator, for example, will enter into a lease on behalf of, of the partners and the unincorporated JV. Um, at, at the moment, um, most companies would report their share of that lease obligation, but I think under the new standard to be determined, only the, the actual company that signs the lease would show its obligation, 100% of the obligation, and its, its core partners in the venture, its partners in the venture, would um, wouldn't show anything at all. Okay,
thinking of the, of the timeline, um, the, the issue, the standard was issued in the uh, in January uh, last year. Uh, this is our typical uh, potential timeline line here. Um, more reports of lease commitments, and a lot of it is about collecting collecting the data. Um, an IT, selecting an IT system, starting collecting the data ahead of the ahead of the ahead of the um, standard coming into force. See, you know, maybe starting with the, the bigger the bigger leases, see what information is there, what information you have. Um, training policy training for you know, for the for across the organisation. Any anyone who gets involved in this, whether it's on the from, from the treasury side, people who sort of manage this from from the from the accounting people, the inputers or, or, or the uh, people overviewing the management information. Uh, then a system go live maybe halfway through next year. Look at delegations of authority within the organisation. Uh, leases will be reported differently, will be managed differently. Um, investor update, uh, and then then it takes effect. So for many of us, we'll first be reporting on the new standards in first quarter of 2019. So of the ones that you've mentioned, what what do you think are the key issues? I think a key issue is, is the quality of, of the data for, for leases. And up, now, up until now, um, leases are, are disclosed. Uh, I think the big leases that companies have are probably quite closely monitored, but there are a lot of uh, medium and smaller size leases which are less closely monitored, and the quality of information there is perhaps adequate for our disclosure to the notes, but it have to be um, of a higher level of quality and reliability when it's when it's actually in the accounts, which is actually part and parcel of the accounts. I think also the IT system. Um, it's been long trailed the the standard. I mean, it's been expected for for many years, um, but it was only actually issued um, what, less than 18 months ago. And um, I, I don't think these these are IT systems off-the-shelf packages available at the moment. I think they're still in development. Some are more advanced, advanced than, than, than others. So, it's, um, it's, I think the, the IT is, is a big challenge. So, where, where does Treasury come in? It comes in, I think, um, in the practical side, the discount rate models. Um, Mentioned earlier, these, these two models. If you know it, um, this is like finance leases. Some of us will be familiar with. Who's interested in just in lease? Fairly straightforward to work out, as long as you know the the, the cash flows, and particularly the hard one to know is the residual value. So a reliable estimate of the residual value of the asset. Um, and if that's not available, then you use incremental borrowing rate, um, which I think will be done for the majority of leases. Um, the cost of debt for specific lessees and assumptions we update on a regular basis. So I think the, the incremental borrowing will come from, from Treasury, Treasury Department. Um, Treasury will also be even more interested than, than currently in lease resource. It will, uh, any lease will create, or any lease that's more than 12 months or material, will create debt. And that's, that will be of interest to the Treasury Department, and Treasury will be looking to monitor that, manage relationship with the investors and the rating agencies. So they very firmly fall, in my view, within Treasury's remit. And how straightforward would it, or will it be to derive um, the discount rate you mentioned? Um, I think interesting implicit in the lease, let's say if you can get the residual buy in, incremental borrowing rate. I think the, uh, the IFRS standard is. is um, Maybe over demanding. It talks about the rate of interest the lessee would have to pay to borrow over some similar term with a similar security, which I'm, uh, I'm interpreting as security over the, the leased assets. Some lessee to obtain an asset of similar value to the right of use assets in a similar economic environment. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent that information is, is available. Um, a lot of companies don't borrow against you know, um, their, 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 their leased assets. Um, so I think it may be for pragmatic reasons uh, a more generic approach will be taken. It would still depend on the term of the lease. It would depend on, on, the, on the identity of the lessee, which particular entity is, 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 is leasing the assets, or is it guaranteed, which is it guaranteeing the lease of the assets. Um, 
but to go down to the granularity of borrowing against that specific asset, and I'm not sure if the data will be available uh, to to um, determine that. So we're already seeing, many of us have already be seeing proposals that are um, for policies that we're committed to now that will run beyond 2019. And we can create models which, very simple models which can estimate what, what that amount will be to give decision makers within the company an idea of what sort of assets and liabilities will be coming onto the balance sheet if, if they support the proposal in front of them. Once, once it's in place from January 19, um, in terms of company governance, financial framework, board delegations will have to be looked at um, to affect changes in growth steps and net debt giving ratio. Um, and leasing will have to be very tightly planned. So if you enter into a lease, you'll increase the fixed assets in the book, you'll, you'll increase the liability. That's not happening. Most companies and their investors monitor that very tightly and we want to be in a position to say with confidence or forecast with confidence what their what their lease assets and liabilities will be at the end of their accounting period. Thank you very much indeed, Henry. Um, just to, to pick up uh, from Henry's points, I'm going to look now at the uh, lease accounting changes but from the lens of a property uh, uh, property person. Um, MG Real Estate is a landlord in this case, but very interested in the impact of the lease counting changes on the counterparts of the transactions that we enter into. So I'm going to cover what we think the, the key changes are from, from a property perspective, what do we think the impacts will be on occupiers, and uh, just a little bit of forward looking as to what we think is going to happen to the market um, and what our view is on, on those changes. So, first of all, uh, just to reiterate uh, what Henry was talking about in terms of all leases coming on balance sheet, um, I've taken some stats from the International Accounting Standards Board, um, uh, the, the standard itself, just to um, highlight the size of the issue that 85% um, uh, of leases are off balance sheet, and we're really talking about uh, lease commitments totaling about $3.3 trillion. So it's not an insignificant issue. Um, from a property perspective, roughly 98% of property leases are off balance sheet or currently treated as operating leases, and clearly that is now going to change. So um, <coughs> the two accounting standards, both the International Accounting Standards uh, implementation of this through IFRS 16, and I'm going to touch on the differences with the US GAAP in a second, um, their implementation. But on this slide, you can see um, just briefly the initially the, in, under the International Accounting Standards Board, uh, their adoption means that uh, depending on the method of adoption, first time adoption, which Henry outlined just now, um, an additional charge is likely to be created in the PL from day one. Um, the longer the lease, the higher the day, char day one charge is likely to be, and we'll look at a little bit more detail of that in a moment. And really, just sort of to summarise that in the graph, you can see that um, if, uh, in this small example, the green line is the cash of a lease, which represents a seven-year office lease uh, with an annual rent of, five, in this case, 500,000 euros, um, annually indexed uh, with 3% annual uplift. You can see the differing impact between the two accounting standards on the likely P&L charge. So under FASB, they're, they're straight line expensing it, uh, to turn that into a verb, uh, and that's the blue line, the blue horizontal line. However, under the International Accounting Standards Board, we've got a, uh, the, the finance lease treatment that will be new to property readers of, um, of, 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 of the accounts. Um, Occupiers are therefore going to be quite sensitive to uh, the day one PNL impact, we believe, and this is, where the, this is where the biggest difference is between the International Accounting Standards Board and US GAAP implementation of the standards. Um, the, as I said, the PNL impact under the US GAAP um, is going to be a flat line, and so it didn't, isn't actually materially going to change from the current treatment under US GAAP. 
Matthew, are there any other key uh, US gap differences? Yes, uh, interestingly enough, um, the, the treatment of profit under sign and leasebacks um, is going to reverse. So under current accounting, under the International Accounting Standards Board, accounting, uh, profit from a sign and leaseback can, can be taken as a single item, probably exceptional in the year that the transaction is executed, whereas under, currently under US GAAP, the profit is spread over the duration of the lease. That position is literally reversed post changes with the international, under, the, under the International Accounting Standards Board uh, solution, the profit is to be, to, to be spread over the duration of the lease, and under US GAAP, they will be able to take the profit in the year of the transaction, in the accounting period that the transaction is completed. So moving on, um, what do we think? The, what does the market think the impact is going to be on occupiers of property um, with this accounting change? So I suppose um, the first and probably the most important uh, point here is that uh, all property leasing decisions are now going to become a funding decision, the funding of the occupancy of real estate. So. Um, Clearly, own versus lease strategies are being reviewed. Uh, if, it, if, the answer, if the economic answer is to lease, then how to lease is going to be uh, carefully monitored. Property impact on current accounting is simply an annual charge through the P&L, but um, going forward, the totality of the obligation is going to go on the balance sheet and clearly a bigger P&L impact. So we believe there's going to be a far greater support needed from both the finance and treasury communities within corporates to support their property colleagues who may well not be versed uh, in the, the accounting nuances of a property leasing transaction. Matthew, you mentioned finance and treasury there, but realistically, is it going to be one or the other? Um, I think in reality, um, as all property leases are now on balance sheet, this is less of an accounting issue and more of a finance issue, and, th and therefore actually it's a debt issue, and I think the support's going to need to, to be, come from the, the Treasury side, mm -hmm. because it's really a question of how this is going to be funded. And as Henry alluded to earlier on, this is now a debt issue. Yeah. Um, the, mar the, the, the property market generally expects occupiers to resist uh, the need to enter into long-term leases and enter into short, shorter-term contracts to minimise the day one impact on their P&L. Um, and we think, uh, in a, certainly as soon as the accounting standard is in, those that account under the international accounting standards, if the motivation for doing certain lease backs in the past has been short-term profit generation, that arbitrage clearly has disappeared. If it was an economic driver, then that clearly will remain extant. Um, so increased transparency to take, is likely to take place um, across an entire estate. An occupier will have to account for the totality of their obligations and therefore any surplus space in, uh, in, a, in a state will come under further scrutiny than it does already and so we think there will be pressure for organisations to right size their estates. Um, some have gone so far as to suggest that this accounting standard will have a negative impact on real estate values. Whether it goes that far, time will tell. Okay, so what do we think the, the potential mitigations might be for, for, the occupi for occupiers and what do, you think, what do we think the changes will be in the property leasing market? where occupiers clearly decide to lease rather than own. Now, we've, we've, we've looked um, at a number of scenarios here, and I wanted just to, to talk through the table and the graph, because it sort of brings it to life. Um, we're looking at a theoretical um, situation in this uh, table where uh, an occupier wants to fund a new building, um, and let's say, for the sake of argument, it costs them £100 million pounds to, to build that building, um, and they want to lease it they want, to, they want to, someone else to fund it for them and do so by entering into a lease. Um, what we've, we've priced here is different lease, lease structures to generate £100 million with differing rental levels to fund the same capital proceeds, which in turn generate different accounting outputs. So for the same capital proceeds, you can see in the table a diminishing rent for a longer lease period which has, the added, which has the benefit of having a, a, a lower day one P&L impact. So I think we're, we're looking at a fairly different dynamic for the property leasing market going forward 
where rent in the future should probably be a, least, a function of the lease length an occupier is prepared to enter into and the credit rating of that occupier. That in theory, I think I might just, uh, I'd like to just explain a little bit further that particular point. Um, the current property market um, does not differentiate rental levels between lease lengths. Um, and under, current, uh, under, the, uh, under the accounting changes, this is what it would look like if someone signed, an occupier signed a longer lease. So if they signed a lease for £100, and that's the red line, if they were to sign a five-year lease, then the dark blue line would be the P&L treatment. If they were signed a 20-year lease, then graphically the uh, light blue line would be what the P&L treatment would look like. And you may say, well, why would they want to sign a long lease? Because clearly the day one P&L impact is going up. They would, after the end of the five-year term, if they were to renew, they would have a spike up of their P&L and the same profile repeating itself. If, however, um, they were to sign a lease of a, at a longer term at a lower rent and be compensated by a landlord to do so, then they could potentially enter into a lease at a lower P&L for the same building at a lower rent. And that is broadly the compensation a landlord should give to an occupier for entering, entering into a new lease. And that behaviour, we believe, will be driven by this accounting change. So in summary, what do we think, what do we think the commercial behaviours will be that are driven by this single uh, lease accounting change? Well, fundamentally, we think there are three things. That everything is now on balance sheet. Every leasing decision will result in an entry, entry on the balance sheet. So property leasing decisions should now be exclusively about e the economics rather than the accounting. Um, if leasing is, the, presuming leasing is the better of the two economic outcomes, then, the, then all, all the tests that have been used for the last 20 odd years since the international accounting standards were first brought in to differentiate, differentiate between operating leases and finance leases have now become academic. So options such as buying back the property for a pound, which would have immediately created finance lease treatment, are now available in the property leasing world. So behaviours will change as a result of those constraints effectively being removed from the property leasing world. So, we believe the property leasing world will become, should become considerably more sophisticated than it is today, with rental level becoming a function of lease length and credit rating, with effectively premium rents being charged for shorter term flexible space, and heavily discounted rents being charged for longer leases to investment grade occupiers. So, so a much more dynamic, much more price sensitive property market than perhaps the one we've seen to date. And I think the role that Treasury can fulfill in supporting their property community, their property colleagues to understand this, I think, will be well, well received. Excellent. Thank you very much. Moving on to uh, our panel discussion. Question, uh, Henry, for you. We, we've spoken today about uh, you know, some significant changes to leasing and, and you know, this standard has been said as you know, one of the the biggest changes to accounting uh, in, a, in a long while. Has the definition of what a lease is materially, materially changed? Um, it's broadly the same, but it's not exactly the same. So yes, it has changed. Um, the, the new element, I think, is that the customer has the, um, they're looking to see if the customer has the right to control the use of an asset. So it's looking at the controlling the use of the asset during the lease. Um, so it's moved away from IS um, 17 or 4 in that sense. And so the customer has the right to direct the use of asset if he um, directs how of what purpose it's used in economic terms, or in the case if, if the use is, is predetermined in some way and he was involved in construction of the asset or he operates the asset. And uh, very helpfully, the uh, International County Standards Board um, provided, um, all, um, has provided quite a number of examples um, which, which you need really to, to refer to to understand how, how this can apply in, in certain circumstances. Um, so I think, let's say the vast majority will be unchanged. I think it would be 
rare for something that wasn't a lease before to become a lease now. I think if it did, that would be something that has its predetermined use um, and, and the, the customer was involved in the construction of the asset. But I think that would be quite unusual. I think what would be more likely is um, a few items that were leases before that are no longer uh, a lease under the new, under the new standards. Um, Any examples? Um, yes. Yeah, so I think, for example, if you if you have a, an arrangement where, whereby the customer takes all the uh, output from from a, a power plant, for example, um, previously that that would have been leased um, because of control of an identified asset. Um, whereas now. Um, Probably would not be a lease because the the customer would not be directing the use of the power plant during the lease. They're just selling electricity. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Um, moving on, transparency of financial statements. Um, Matthew, you, you touched on um, credit rating agencies and, and also um, market analysts. Um, They've used for many years um, treat operating leases and finance leases and adjusted uh, their cash flow and, and debt accordingly. And, and um, I think you know there's a multiple a standard multiple that's used. Um, IFRS 16 is obviously going to increase transparency, and that's one of the key objectives behind all these changes. But do you think it will have a material impact and alter credit or investment decisions? Um, I think, in fairness, the the analyst community and the credit rating agencies for some time have been uh, uh, capitalising leases synthetically and putting on their balance sheets, balance sheets that they use for analysis. They've been doing so generally on a consistent basis, depending on which house is doing it, mm -hmm. whether it's eight times multiple or a number of variations upon that, um, using the, what is the publicly available information, which is semi-perfect, um, hence the whole reason for doing this accounting, having this accounting change, as you rightly like point out. What will become now uh, completely transparent are the contingent liabilities that an organisation has already entered into. If the assumption that the analysts have been making is materially different from the underlying obligations that a company has entered into, for the sake of argument if a company has done very, very long dated sale leasebacks, and the analysts have effectively underestimated the obligations that may have an impact on the balance sheet. Conversely, if there's more flexibility in an organisation with a shorter average lease length, they may have overestimated the obligations. So in those circumstances, there may be a variance, but I think uh, the majority will probably sit in the median and the middle. Okay. Excellent. Um, and moving on to impact of accounting standards, again, we've, we've covered uh, some of this during the, the presentation. But Henry, um, I mean, you're oil and gas, Matthew's real estate, but what other industries uh, are going to be significantly impacted by this uh, new accounting standard? I think, I think almost all, um, the majority of industries will, will, be, will be affected. Um, most, most, um, most businesses do lease some assets at, at some level. Um, some, of course, will be more significantly affected than, 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 than others. Airline industries, in particular, um, will be um, probably the most affected from, from the aircraft which they lease. In the oil industry, it's uh, typically rigs, ships, um, but like, you know, as, as Matthew's covered, um, offices in most, most businesses yeah, yeah. will, will um, lease offices or, or, or service stations or factory space. Mm -hmm. So I think it will touch uh, almost, almost everyone. Even the ACT? Okay, um, I think that's all we've got time for today. I'd like to thank my panelists, Henry and Matthew. And just to wrap up, um, I'll mention a few events that we've got on um, and webinars coming up. They're on the screen there. We've got the um, our Asian conference in Hong Kong in September, uh, Treasury Forum in November on the same day as the annual dinner, and um, our Middle East uh, summit in Dubai. And I'd also point out the upcoming um, June uh, briefing um, event we've got there that's on the um, Global Effects Code and the UK Money Market Code. Um, so just a reminder of those. Uh, also, uh, 
delegates can send any questions that you have into uh, the website that should be on your screen, so your email, on to events at treasurers.org. Um, and thank you very much for joining us today.